in the early universe, go back to the Big Bang and you have this cauldron of matter and energy. Well, we don't have stars yet. We don't have galaxies yet. This organizing principle of stars as they gather into cities. No, it's just matter and energy. And it takes a while for the expanding universe to cool so that matter can coalesce to make stars and ultimately galaxies. So there's a period of time after light was sent free in the universe, because before then it was constantly interacting with matter and the universe was just a fog. Light gets set free once we've expanded enough. This happened around 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Now light is set free, but okay, we don't have any objects that generate light. Okay, so in this period, between 400,000 years and the first stars, we call that the Dark Ages. There was nothing there to radiate. Yes, there was leftover light from the Big Bang, but no objects talking to us. So we calculate, we put out our best understanding of the universe for gravity, quantum physics, nuclear fusion physics, and all of this. We put on our best thinking caps and say, It'll take about this long, one or two billion years, just to get the stars going. And then you need enough stars in a place to gather and make a galaxy. And a galaxy will have enough light for you to see from a great distance. It'd be very hard to see individual stars. Okay, that's our model of the early universe. Now we say, we don't understand how galaxies are born. Let's make a telescope to help us. So we spec the next generation space telescope after Hubble to be exquisitely tuned to show us galaxies being born. And we expect it to show us galaxies at the end of the dark ages, at the birth of objects in the universe. So we design and build this telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. Now what's different about it because we'd expect galaxies that are just born to be giving off intense amounts of high energy light, ultraviolet light especially, because certain classes of brand new stars give off copious amounts of this kind of light. How do we see those galaxies today? Well, if that was that long ago and the universe has expanded, that ultraviolet light is no longer ultraviolet light. No, over the expansion of the universe, those wavelengths have been stretched. 13.8 billion years later, today, ultraviolet light emitted at the early universe has been stretched to become infrared light. Oh my gosh, okay. Well, we knew this would happen, but it's kind of, it's amazing that we can fool the universe into saying, you're not, we know you gave off ultraviolet when you're born and we're gonna look for you in the infrared. You're not gonna get by us. So we make the James Webb Space Telescope exquisitely tuned to see infrared emission that started out as ultraviolet in the early universe. Bada bing, we turn on the telescope. Oh, by the way, infrared is also good for looking inside gas clouds that are sitting in front of our nose to see the birth of stars, otherwise cloaked in the gas clouds from which they're born. Cloaked, you can't see it with visible light because the visible light scatters and you can't see it. It's hidden if you're using visible light. But if you use infrared light, that infrared comes from the stars and pops right out of those gas clouds. And you see where all the stars are, as well as the newborn planets in orbit around them. So the James Webb Space Telescope is good for stuff nearby, just as it's good for stuff long ago. All right, so now let's tune the telescope in to galaxies being born. And oh my gosh, who ordered this? We're finding galaxies in the Dark Ages. We have no idea, no idea. And I'm told the lead researcher was so shocked by this, he spit out his coffee when he realized what kind of data he had on his hands. So I can give a list, what's the list? Either we don't understand how galaxies are formed, of course we don't fully understand it, that's why we built the telescope, but 
all of our understanding about matter and energy that tells us that there should be a dark ages, something had to change. We gotta go back and adjust that somehow in ways we don't know or understand yet. Or some new kind of object, unlike any other objects we've ever seen, had no trouble forming in the dark ages. Or us placing it in the dark ages is somehow flawed. We're basing this on just pictures of these galaxies and what their properties are via pictures. What we are waiting for now is we want to get a spectrum of those galaxies, of those objects. Let me not even call them galaxies because they could be something else. You can tell us what chemical elements are there. A rainbow is a spectrum of the sun, right? White light comes through, goes through a raindrop, out comes its component colors. If you looked even more carefully at it, those colors reveal the chemistry of what's going on in the sun, the chemical elements that are there. You can also find out other things, like how fast is the sun rotating? All kinds of things you can find out when you get the spectrum. So if we get the spectrum of these objects, we'll know what they're made of. We will even be able to better place them in distance. Maybe there's something contaminating our estimate of its distance, and maybe they're really on the edge of the Dark Ages, but somehow they're masquerading as though they're a little farther away, deep within the Dark Age. Who knows? Or, as some people love to speculate, when they encounter something they don't understand, they're aliens. <laughs> If that's your first thought, okay, I'm not gonna stop you. But generally, we leave that for the last possible guess that we would place on something that we don't understand. And by the way, just to be fair to us, we built this telescope for this purpose, to help us understand the birth of galaxies. When you build a new telescope with access to times and places and regimes in the universe open a new window on cosmic phenomenon, yes, it'll help you understand things you already had some idea about, but you know what else it always does? Makes discoveries you had no way to even anticipate. And that is the glory of science on the frontier. So if you see a newspaper article, say, oh, scientists have to go back and adjust their cherished theories, they have to go back to the drawing board, we're always at the drawing board because that's the fundamental feature of what it is to make discoveries in this world. To stand with one foot inside the circle and put a foot outside where we have yet to peer. Because as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. In your life, you must learn to love the questions themselves and celebrate the unknown rather than fear it. And that's what's up with that.